studios in New York City. This is Charlie Rose. A young man named Don Keogh worked for the Butternut Coffee Company when it was acquired by Coca-Cola in 1960. His life after that was never the same. Don Keogh would go on to lead Coke as president and chief operating officer from 1981 until he retired in 1993. During that period, revenue rose to $14 billion from $5.9 billion, and the average earnings gain was about 15% annually. Reflecting on his time at the company, Don said, I kept my head down. I jumped into a little creek, which became a river, which turned into a gulf, which grew into an ocean. All I ever did was swim. He went on to become non-executive chairman of Allen & Company, where he loved meeting young entrepreneurs from around the world who had plans for businesses. He remarked, quote, it is a lot of people betting on the future. It keeps me young. Don Keogh died last month at the age of 88 after a brief bout with pneumonia. Today, we look back with an appreciation of his life. Joining me now, four men who knew him. Mutar Ken is CEO of Coke. Father John Jenkins is president of the University of Notre Dame. Timothy Shriver is chairman of the Special Olympics. And from Omaha, Nebraska, is Warren Buffett. He is chairman and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway. I am pleased to have them here. Don Keogh was a friend of this program as well and a good friend of mine. So uh, friends celebrate him and appreciate him this evening. And so I'd like to begin with you, Warren. Tell me what he meant to you because you go back further than any of us in knowing uh, Don, who became a neighbor. Yeah, Don, Don moved in right across the street from uh, where I live now and uh, in, in about 1960, 1959 perhaps. And his, his front door was 100, 100 feet from our front door. And believe me, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of movement between those two doors. Uh, he was a wonderful friend uh, 55 years ago and that friendship continued every day uh, until just a week or two ago. Here is an interview that he did with me talking about buying the house next to you, Warren. It's part of a documentary I did about you. Roll tape. How close did you live to the Buffets? Well, I lived across the street. <laughs> across the street? Across the street. We, uh, I bought a house there in, in uh, around 1959. A three-story house, brick house, a tile roof, paid $27,500 for it. And there was a young fellow living across the street in another house, good big house. He paid 30000 I think, for his. His name was Warren Buffett. He wasn't a, he, nobody knew who he was. Uh, he was a nice guy. He had, I think he and Susie had three kids. We had four working on five. And, uh, you know, uh, I got to know him. Uh, he wasn't easy to know because he, he, he didn't see much of him. But my kids did. You know, the, the, of course, the real story is that he came across the street one day and he said, Don, I love your kids. I said, I know. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, I was thinking about college, you know. Uh, uh, you know, getting kids through college isn't easy. I said, Warren, I'm working on grade school right now. I'll get around to college a little later. He said, I've started a little fund. People putting a little money into it. And uh, if you gave me, say, $10,000, uh, I think I could build that up into something. Well, Charlie, I, I didn't give it to him. <laughs> for, for two reasons. One, I didn't have it. I could have borrowed it from my father. <laughs> But uh, I went into Mickey and said, can you imagine giving $10,000 to a guy who doesn't get up and go to work in the morning? <laughs> the, uh, that was one of my great decisions of my life. If you had given him that $10,000. Don't 000. ask. Yeah, probably over $400 million. Yeah, $400 million. Million. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've talked We're about that. We're still friends, incidentally. <laughs> Remember that, Warren? I, re I remember it very well because I was then, I worked out of my house for about six years. There was a little sewing room off the be bedroom. And so every morning when Don go off to sell coffee, his, his, his oldest daughter, Kathy, would come over. And we had this jungle gym on the side there with a the slide and the swings. And he, the last thing he would see before going to work was me pushing Kathy on the swings or her pushing me. And I think that made him a little leery of giving me the 10000 but. He, when he came along later, he asked if he could give it to me retroactively. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever remind him of how much it was? <laughs> well, he, he seemed to do pretty well himself, yeah, it, but it, it is kind of it, it's kind of interesting that two guys living across from each other, you know, both living in houses that cost about thirty thousand, and he ends up being president of the Coca Cola Company, and we ended up buying a lot of stock in it. <laughs> And we've got the CEO here tonight to talk about that. Uh, you said three words described him. Everybody loved him. That's absolutely true. How many people, 88, 
Can you make that statement about? But everybody did love him, and it was intergenerational, Charlie. He, uh, I loved him. My wife's, uh, my two wives loved him. My kids loved him. My grandchildren loved him. I mean, he he could connect with anyone, and he connected it immediately. And he knew more about people and human nature when he was 20 than I've learned in 84 years. Incredible man. Uh, Mutal, what did he mean to you? Um, Warren is right. Everybody loved him. Everybody respected him. Uh, everybody. It's not just the um, customer or the truck driver or the store owner. Uh, heads of government respected him. He, he was such a wide giant uh, of a person. Um, I don't think I'll ever meet someone like that in my life. It, I think if you're lucky, if you're really, really lucky, someone like that comes across your life once, if you're really, really lucky. Uh, and that's who Don was. And uh, he taught, I met him uh, very early on, in the very early 80s, uh, when I, I joined the Coca-Cola company in 1978. And um, ever since that time, you know, we had an incredible bond and close relationship. He taught me all I knew about what I had to know. And when you think of Peter Drucker's book, The Effective Executive, I think he wrote about Don Quixote. That was Don Quixote. And then he was much more than that because he was also a wonderful family person, a, a, an incredible father, incredible um, statesman. Um, and he knew he could go up and down from... He could go from 50,000 feet all the way down to zero and then go right back up again. And so those are things that are, don't, don't, are not always learned. I think, you know, it's combined. He used to learn till the day that he passed. I know that. Every, every single day. He would say, your brain, brain is like a sponge. It just keeps taking it in and you have to open it so that you can get more information every day. And um, again, um, you know, when I... When I told my wife he'd passed, she started crying. And she, that's how people so, so loved him. Fair to say you wouldn't be in the position you're in without... Without any question uh, that he was somebody that touched me and I've become what I am as a result of that. Father Jenkins? Yeah. Uh, he had a close relationship with Notre Dame? Yeah, he did. And, and personally, as with Mutar, he's a great mentor. I remember I've been t president of Notre Dame for 10 years, and his, his sayings, you know, stay nervous, uh, avoid com complacency and hubris, kind of ring in my head and had a huge impact on me. I think one of the things Don gives you, gave me, is he was very generous with resource, but most importantly, he was generous with his vision. He challenged you to be better, and he, his, he had an inspirational way about him that made us better. That's why we have here, we, here St. Patrick's Day, one of the great Irish studies centers, because Don insisted on it, because he was a proud Irish American. In, in fact, he said to you, you know, this great university doesn't have an Irish studies program, yeah, exactly. and it exactly. needs one. It's the fighting Irish, and you don't study <laughs> Ireland. So, so we, we went from zero to the best outside Ireland because of Don, but not because of his generosity, because of his vision. And that's what he gave. He inspired you to do great things. Uh, Special Olympics were what, Tim, 1968? Started in 1968. I'm thinking that probably we owe our, our, our success to this catastrophic, that poor decision Don made with Warren Buffett's offer because I think <laughs> my mother, an Irish American, <laughs> went to him right around the beginning of the Special Olympics movement and probably said to him something like, I got about 10,000 athletes and I want to grow it. And he probably heard an echo of Buffett's <laughs> voice in the back of his head saying, I'm not making this mistake, boys. <laughs> uh, I think what's, what's extra, I mean, just two things jump out at me. First of all, you know, listening to people talk about Don and, and going to his funeral, Charlie, the thing that struck me was how many people talked about him as a dad. And this is a generation of men who grew up to be powerful in politics, powerful in business, powerful in literature and the arts. They weren't really known to be honest, most of them, as dads. Uh, this is a man who, when you look at the full story of his life, almost everybody refers to Mickey. Almost everybody refers to his children and his grandchildren. Almost everybody alluded to the fact he was always there at the Little League game, at the drama show, at the spelling. I mean, this is a man who somehow uh, came through the 50s and the 60s and the 70s when the role of men was changing, when business was changing, when he was in the most competitive businesses in the world, really a challenge to swim in an ocean, as he said, and still managed to convince everyone around him that his family was the most important thing in his life. 
which I find so inspiring to, to men today. You had a close relationship with your mother? He did. Uh, uh, he he believed he saw something about business. I think before most people, and my mom was 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 captivated by this. He saw that business had to be about values, not just about bottom line. Uh, he knew that he could build his business if he had people who believed in his brands and believed in his products, who trusted his products, who understood that it was a promise. And the promise wasn't just inside the bottle, but it was all around the bottle. So my mother was enormously charmed. I mean, the Special Olympics movement today is five million athletes, Charlie. But I'll tell you right now, it would not be where it was, uh, where it is right now, were it not for the fact that one corporate executive uh, who had a global portfolio and who had a giant heart said, this is something our business can believe in that will be good for human beings and be good for this company too. The heart that was there uh, as an executive at Coca-Cola was reflected in all the global trips he made where he would go and see Coke employees around the world and, and, and bring the, the heart of the company to Yeah, them. I mean, Don got involved with the world of the globe in the 1980s when, you know, he really became... Uh, the the president and chief operating officer and and from that minute on it was like the he was the person to go to person for everyone in the United mm -hmm. States of America of what is happening in the world so quickly how can someone just start this journey and become so quickly the have that knowledge have that inspired knowledge and he he basically always had a, had wisdom that he was willing to share with everyone, and and um, the other thing is so so th there wasn't a period of time when after he retired I would meet uh, prime ministers you know President Lenk Walensa of of, of Poland um, uh, the prime uh, President Vaclav Havel of of the Czech Republic uh, prime ministers all across the world the Prime Minister from, from Austria, how is Don Kio? They wouldn't say, how is business? How is everything? How, how is Don Kio? Please give him my bet. The years after he retired. Still happens today. And um, we got letters from all kinds of statesmen uh, that, that are in their 80s, 90s, retired. We just heard our condolences. And, and it's never... It's very unusual, and it's it's the man. It's who he is. What was the relationship he had and the partnership he had uh, with Roberto so that they became, as some have said, a perfect uh, combination? They were a perfect partnership. Uh, I've, seen a, I've seen probably three or four partnerships in business that, that really just stand out from all the rest. And certainly, when Roberto and, and Don combined their strengths, it really was a case of you know, two plus two equaling a lot more than four. Uh, they, they, they were complementary to each other in an extraordinary way, and neither would have achieved the success they did uh, without the other one. But Don, uh, Don was indispensable uh, to Roberto. I watched that for many years. Uh, uh, let me let me tell you one story that uh, I feel I owe it to Don to tell us because he never he never talked about it. But we were up in Sun Valley one time, and. Uh, we were playing a golf match against his son Clark and my son-in-law Alan, and we, we really wanted to beat these young guys. <laughs> so we started out a little. We were three down, and, and I forget whether it was the fifth or sixth hole, but we were three down, and it was, it was starting very badly. And we got to this par three, and I said, I said, Don, the only way we're going to turn the tide is if you knock this in. And he actually hit a hole in one at that point. <laughs> and totally destroyed these kids. And we went on to win the match. And I, Don never told that story, but you can confirm it with Clark and Alan. <laughs> yeah, There's also the story that he told me about uh, discovering your investment in Coca-Cola. That somehow <laughs> Roberto may have asked Don, uh, somebody's buying our stock, what's going on? And, and he said to Roberto, let me make a phone call. I know a guy. <laughs> and he we, called you up we, to say? Yeah, well, we bought about 6% of the company, and I don't like to, <laughs> anybody to know when we're buying because it causes the price to go up. So I, I didn't tell anybody. And all of a sudden, the phone rang one time, and, and I pick up the phone, and, and I, I can remember his exact words. He said, Warren, he said, you wouldn't be buying a share or two of Coca-Cola stock, would you? <laughs> And the cat was out of the bag. <laughs>
they bought a lot of shares, didn't they, Mouton? <laughs> That's right. Uh, there's, there, there's also the sense of understanding the company and its brand. Uh, no one was a better um, communicator of what the brand meant and what it meant to him and which he talked about. He said, I define my role to protect and enhance the trademark of the company. Yeah, he would always say, uh, I have a very simple job. All I do is go in every morning, wherever I go to, uh, working for the Coca-Cola company and its bottlers, and I polish the brand a little more each day. And uh, that's what he would say. And uh, that's what he did. And he did it so masterfully. There was nobody living that personified the brand better than Don until he passed away uh, last month. There was just no one that came close. And... Um, that's why we, you know, we named um, a leadership, uh, our current leadership academy at the Coca-Cola Company, the Donald R. Keel Leadership Academy. And, um, teaching young entrepreneurs Teaching what? young leaders of the company, yeah. young entrepreneurs, young leaders uh, about leadership and how Don, it was personified in Don. His values. His values, um, his wisdom, his wit, his humbleness, um, uh, and his way of clear communication and how... He would set priorities automatically. It would just come so naturally to him. One of the things he said um, that success made him nervous uh, because it scared him that there would be arrogance and complacency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was his theme, and he, I heard that many, many times from him. And uh, stay nervous is what he told me uh, frequently, and good advice, good advice. I mean, a, a brand like Coke, it's easy to write on, on that or, or Notre Dame, but, but he was always pushing for more. And he brought the same discipline, Charlie, to the issue of the, uh, you know, if I can say the not-for-profit sector. When, when he, the, the initial sponsorship, if you will, of the Special Olympics movement in the 70s, you know, he wanted to do something good for people, and he thought it was good for the Coca-Cola company, but he was clever, too. He bought 100,000 T-shirts. I think he bought them for about $1.50 each. And that summer, every single local Special Olympics event all over the United States, was just about 1,000 or 1,500 T-shirts were distributed. Every single volunteer. Uh, became an ambassador. The brand was all over it. I mean, you talk about polishing the brand. He polished the brand 100,000 times on the day those t-shirts were shipped. And his message was, 100,000 this year, we got to do more next year. You've got to grow this thing. And when I went in to see him when I was in my 30s and thinking about my own career, looking to him for advice, as so many of us did, uh, his challenge to me was, how do you grow this thing? How do you bring it to China and India? How do you make a difference for more children? Uh, talk to the folks down in Atlanta. Don't, he always said, don't take too much of their time. Just ask them for what you need and then get the hell out of the way. <laughs> I've tried to follow that advice, not always successfully. <laughs> Let's talk about New Coke. Uh, he was part of that disaster. <laughs> but he said, we're not, as, we're not as smart to have thought it would be perfect, uh, too dumb to have not realized the mistake. Well, I think it's, a it's, it's all about also having the courage to do, the, do something uh, because uh, rather than just um, you know, watch things happen, take destiny into your hands, do something, uh, and, and have the courage. Where the, he always used to say, where, there's, where there is no risk, there is no reward. And, um, and I always repeat that all the time. And... Um, so, yes, not everything that you do has to work, but making decisions and standing behind those decisions and be willing to admit that something is not working and go and change, have the flexibility. Perfect example of that. Uh, uh, and, and, the and, and the brand and the company got stronger and better as a result of all of that put together. That's why he would say to you, you know, we didn't do it on purpose. We're not as... as stupid or we're not as, as, as clever as all of that seems. And, and he was exactly, you know, talking about how he felt. Uh, Warren, did he talk to you about that decision at the time? I mean, you were on the board, by the way. No, no, I wasn't on the board at that time. Okay. And in fact, none of us, none of us were there at, the, at that time. <laughs> you, to you don't know anybody that was there. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was out, I was out of communication. But the one thing he did tell me, he said, he was talking to me about it afterwards, and he said, you know, he said, when those letters started arriving at headquarters, addressed to supreme idiot, and they brought him into my desk, he said, I, I started to get the idea maybe we, we'd lost a little something here. <laughs> Here is Don talking about that very decision with me at this table. Here it is. Uh, the, our U.S. business had some challenges. The uh, 
a, a new formulation was built. Roberto had, had said from the day we started, he, he said, let's kill a separate car every day. Everything's up for grabs. Don't be afraid to bring anything in. So a group of our, our technicians and our U.S. management developed what they thought was a formulation that was going to take over the world. Now, you know, we sat there at the corporate uh, headquarters uh, sort of isolating ourselves a little bit and saying maybe it would go away. But they kept doing more taste tests. I, I covered it in two or three commandments. They got a lot of outside experts. And uh, sooner or later, these things kind of take on a life of their own. And yeah. I don't want to go into it too far. We ultimately bought into it. I mean, I, we bought into we've it. bought into it. So you recognize the mistake, and, and Coca-Cola did over okay after that. Yeah. I mean, that, where there's no risk, there's no reward. And yeah. be flexible uh, and be fast. And um, that's um, and then, of course, Don, the giant of the man, had the had had the, st the stature to go on television nationwide. I, I think that here. night. The simple fact is that all of the time and money and skill poured into consumer research on the new Coca-Cola could not measure or reveal the depth and abiding emotional attachment to original Coca-Cola felt by so many people. They said that they wanted the original taste of Coca-Cola back and they wanted it soon. I was uh, based overseas at that time, but that night uh, it was first news on all three anchors uh, and he was there in person and talking about it to consumers. and. That's the way to handle something like that. There is no, there's the a perfect example of how you would go out and handle something like that. Um, you know, not everything has to work. Thing is, stand behind your decisions. Be, be, I know when you want to, you, you made a mistake and change them. Warren, he told me a story about that, and he said that some some woman called him up and got through to him and said, "How could you have destroyed uh, Coca-Cola? Because it meant so much to me." And he said. Um, when was the last time you had Coca-Cola? She said, 20 years. And he said, well, why are you so concerned? She said, because you're destroying my youth. And she remembered that Coke yeah. meant more to her than just a drink at some time. It was yeah. memory. The, pe the people own the brand. The people own the brand. And, uh, and taking it away from them, uh, you know, uh, they find out how important that brand was to people. And, and just like that woman that hadn't had one in 20 years. But, but Don... Don was in touch with people. I, I, you know, they may have made a mistake there temporarily, but but he he could he could feel what people were feeling. He didn't even have to put it into words. He just had that ability to uh, uh, to just connect with you in all ways. Uh, the that book he wrote. I don't know whether you're going to get to that. No, or right not, now is a good time. Go ahead. <laughs> well. We have a group that meet, met every two years since 1968. We called it the Graham Group. And actually, Kay and Don Graham were in it, and Tom Murphy was in it, and Bill Gates was in it, Larry Tish, and all of these people. And Don was in it, and, and every time we met, the group wanted to hear Don speak. So I would, you know, I, I, I kind of wanted to rotate things, but they didn't want me to rotate things. They wanted to hear Don. So he, he gave that, the key points in that as, as a talk one time, and the crowd went wild. So we all suggested to him, you know, you got to put it in a book, and, and he did, and uh, the world is better for it. I, I repeat that now because uh, Herbert Allen and I were talking about that earlier today, and Herbert wanted to be with us. He just got back from Australia, and he said to me, Don combined the best values of a great teacher and a great listener. He never held a long meeting, always leaving with you wanting more. He had the unusual combination of needing to be needed, but never needing to be recognized. And, and I heard the speech uh, at Sun Valley, uh, which became the basis for the book. And the book was released, I think, in 2008, and it was called The Ten Commandments for Business Failure. Ten things that you can do for business failure. And they are quit taking risk, be inflexible, isolate yourself, assume infallibility, play the game close to the foul line, don't take time to think, put all your faith in experts, love your bureaucracy, send mixed messages and be afraid of the future. That summed him up, did it not? That's 100%, that's 100%. He, he, and it was, such a, you know, it was such a great way to present it too because everybody's got these 10 rules for success. But he, he, he got, I, I, heard, I heard it in Sun Valley, I heard it with our group. I mean, he, he just had that way of presenting things that grabbed you in the first minute and you were just hoping he, would, he, he wouldn't stop talking, he was so good. Uh, he wrote a letter to you when your mother died. He did. Uh, you know, I think, 
I think he was of an era, uh, Charlie, where there were sort of great Irish Americans, if you will, uh, not just because they were Irish, and uh, but because there was uh, a certain sense of <clears throat> faith that under under underpinned their their lives. Uh, uh, Don was tough. He was raucous. He was funny. He was wise. He took risks. But he had a deep faith, and I think that's what connected him to my mother. They, they had this beautiful, whenever he would see her, and she wasn't a touchy kind of person, <laughs> he would always hold her hand. Yeah. And I never forget it, because no one did that. I mean, her, my father didn't hold her hand. <laughs> I mean, she just wasn't that kind of girl, you know? <laughs> but Don did. But Don did. Don would and reach she across and he'd, and, he'd, and he'd hold her hand and, and look at her in the eye and say, Eunice. And, and they just had a, had a there, was a, there was an energetic connection there that I think he knew that she brought something to him that was important to his life. Uh, not, a, not a great, huge university like Notre Dame and a powerful uh, center for higher education, but these little humble people that she represented also meant something dear to him. And, and she is, as their representative, uh, they formed a beautiful friendship. Here is what he said about Notre Dame versus Nebraska when I asked him about the competition between his beloved Notre Dame and Warren's beloved Nebraska. Roll tape. So, so what happened when they were playing the University of Nebraska? Well, uh, the, I have to and, tell you the, the, the truth. Uh, I was kind of pulling for Notre Dame. Of course you yeah. were, I know. <laughs> and, and, you know, Warren is one of the great fans of the University of Nebraska. We've seen a couple of those games together. <laughs> and Nebraska won both of them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the two of you were there rooting for the opposite teams. <laughs> Charlie, I have to tell you, Don broadcast Nebraska football uh, at the very beginning of television, when there's only one television station in, in Omaha and they paid $25,000 for the rights. So he actually broadcast uh, the game. And of course, he had a 15 minute program uh, on the local TV station at the time. You know, each day, as part of WOW TV's great noon hour show, we have 15 minutes where we drink a little coffee and meet a lot of very interesting people. And he was followed by Johnny Carson, who was just beginning his career. They, they, they lived in the same apartment house. and. And when I would see uh, Don 30 or 40 years later at a Coke meeting or something, he would say, Warren, he said, what, whatever happened to that Car Carson fellow? <laughs> uh, Warren, what were his passions other than Coca-Cola, friendship, um, and Notre Dame? That's a pretty and, good and list. A, and a, and <laughs> Olympics, right there. Special Olympics, too. Yeah. No, he, it was his family and his friends. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, he... For five years after he uh, had oral cancer, he, he made every single one of Berkshire Hathaway's director's meetings. And after every one of them, where maybe eight or nine managers would present, every one of those managers would get an individualized uh, note, note uh, that, that, that meant something to them. I mean, they, he really was analyzing the business they were in, where he might be helpful. And these were not form letters. Every single one of them would get a message that meant something to them specifically. And that went on year after year after year when he could not eat a meal uh, or anything of the sort. He just, he, he came and he participated. You know, he just, anything he did, he did 100%. He was on the board until what? Until a couple of years ago, and then he uh, he 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 um, uh, retired from the board, and then and stayed on as an advisor to the board uh, until he passed away. Uh, and he, you know, to Warren's point about the, the intellect that he put into the let letter, I I kept every single letter that he's written to me over the last 30 years, and there would be one letter that came from him always on St. Patrick's Day, uh, but. I, I obviously received many other letters, uh, and I put them all in a file, and I kind of opened that file and, and read through that file, and it, I had to hold my breath because it is so current. Whatever was written 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, has incredible um, relevance and meaning today. And uh, it's just, they're just beautiful uh, words put together by a deep, uh, strong uh, intellect and passion. Okay, here's a picture with you and, and Luto, you and Don meeting the Australian, the Austrian Prime Minister. This is 1992. Uh, you can see that picture in a moment. Uh, yeah, that was um, Franz uh, Frenitsky, uh, who was Prime Minister of uh, 
of Austria for Chancellor of Austria uh, for 10 years um, from 86 to 96 and there we are uh, in opening our office for Eastern and Central and Southern Europe uh, and Don visited us and you know I traveled with Don a lot and met with a lot of uh, dignitaries and as I said earlier um, there was just a bond, just like what Tim said about the bond between Eunice Shriver and himself. There was just a bond. Those big hands would hold and the eyes would lock in and there was just a deep intellect, humor, wit, understanding, ability to listen to people uh, and contribute. And um, so whether it's Franz uh, Franiski, Chancellor of Austria, presidents all around, there were just... Uh, care about the person and remember those the, ep the even if it was one meeting uh, let me get a final word from each of you Tim um, uh, as we remember and appreciate a friend I think the great thing uh, uh, Charlie about Don is that uh, where business is going today uh, you see brands all over the world trying to find ways to embody big values to capture the power of delivering a product and delivering a value proposition at the same time about being about something more something bigger Don knew that 40 years ago, and he created the world's most powerful brand because he linked it with deep value. Uh, because what he brought to individuals, he brought to the company. Uh, there will be business leaders for the next 20 or 30 years who would do well to study what Don Keogh believed deeply, which is that the heart and soul of a business is just as important as its operations and its efficiencies. Father Jenkins? You know, I just say, I, I just build on what Tim said that, again, Don. You look for technique or you look for some trick he did. It was, it was Don. It was who he was, the values he espoused and lived by, the way in which he connected with people, as Mutar was saying, in a deep level. That gave him the power of, of being a great leader. It wasn't any gimmick. It was Don. And uh, that's what he taught me. He was the most special person uh, that came through my life um, and uh, I, I will always remember him and love him for that and for what he did to uh, make everyone he touched a better person. Warren, final word. I, I just say again, everybody loved him and they were 100% right. For all of you who came here this evening uh, to appreciate Don, thank you so much. Uh, for all who knew him, uh, all who knew of him, and all who wish they had known him, for all those whose lives he touched. We remember him, and our thoughts and sympathy are with his wife, Mickey, his daughters, Kathleen Soto, Shayla Rumley, and Eileen Millard, his sons, Michael and Patrick and Clark, 18 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren, uh, a remarkable man who understood the power of friendship. We remember Don Keogh tonight. Leon Wieseltier is here. He's the former literary editor of The New Republic. He steered the magazine's back of the book through 30 years of politics, literature, and controversy. He resigned from his longtime post last December due to managerial changes. He has <laughs> since joined The Atlantic as a contributing editor and critic. James Bennett, The Atlantic's editor, said in a statement, quote, for a generation of editors and writers, Leon has helped define the standards for piercing criticism of culture and society. He's also joined the Brookings Institution as Isaiah Berlin Senior Fellow in Culture and Policy. I am very, very pleased to have him back at this table. I consider him a great friend, and it is my honor to have his friendship. Welcome. Good to be here, Charlie. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about Israel first. I just read on a BBC account of an interview, I think probably with, um, it, it was reported on MSNBC, so it's probably Andrea Mitchell did an interview. She's over there, in which... Benjamin Netanyahu said he's not against a two-state solution. Oh, yeah, let solution. me guess, right. Yeah, yeah, it's time to take it back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, he basically said, I mean, in the end, that's a good thing. He said that, you know, I, I haven't read the interview, but I read the BBC's account of it, that they have to figure out a way uh, to get to a good two-state solution. First of all, that's not what he said when he summoned the base before the election. He delegitimated the before the election. Yeah, the, he delegitimated the two-state solution, right. which is just about the most dangerous thing anybody can do in terms of prospects for peace and reconciliation. Um, and as soon as he won, I said to someone, well, we're 10 minutes away from learning that he really is for the two-state solution. Uh, I think he treats the subject 
with total cynicism. And I think that whether he is for the two-state solution or isn't for the two-state solution, whether the Bar Ilan speech is the real Netanyahu or whether with this BBC interview is the real Netanyahu. Uh, the BBC was with MSNBC. With MSNBC. Yeah. Whatever it is, he's done nothing in his policies to advance the prospects of a two-state solution. Personally, um, I mean, I don't like being played for a fool, and I don't know which what to believe when it comes to him. Um, I, my own sense is that he is not capable of presiding over the establishment of a Palestinian state, which is one of the reasons that his base supports him. Um, and I think that is you don't think disastrous. He, you don't think he's capable I don't think he's capable now. Let me say, solution. I don't think that Abu Mazen, that, that Abbas is right now capable of presiding over the establishment of a Palestinian state either. Uh, what worries me is not that there is a Palestinian partner and Netanyahu is squandering an opportunity to conclude a deal. What worries me is that in the absence of a Palestinian partner, when neither side wants a two-state solution, Israel is, is pursuing policies that will make that solution even more difficult. Here's what he achieve. said in this interview. I don't want a one-state solution. I want a sustainable, peaceful, two-state solution. But for that but for that circumstances have to change. He says, I never changed, I never changed my speech in Barlon University six years ago calling for a demilitarized Palestinian state that recognized a Jewish state. What has changed is the reality. Look, he's the Prime Minister of Israel. He's in a position to change some of the circumstances that he wished would change. Um, it isn't going to be easy. Um, I don't believe he's ever going to seriously um, cut back on the settlement program. I think the settlements are the most momentous blunder in Israel's history. And most I think momentous blunder, blunder in, in Israel's, Israel's history. history. Absolutely. I think that it, um, look, the Palestinian population that lives where it lives is going to continue to live where it lives, and Israel's going to have to live with it. And these are, these are Israel's neighbors, whatever, whether Israel likes it or not. And anything that poisons or further poisons relations with the Palestinian community is counterproductive to the interests of the state of Israel. Unless you believe that one state um, is, is tenable for the Jews of Israel, but one state will not be greater Israel, it will be greater Palestine. It will mark the end of the Jewish state. If there is one state, it will be greater Palestine. It will Palestine. be greater Palestine for demographic reasons. It will not be greater Israel. And anybody who cares about the survival of Israel must support anything that could be done to bring about the two-state solution. I understand that we've waited decades for it. It's one of those problems. You know, there are problems in life we don't know the solution to, and decades go by and we bang our heads against the wall. This problem we've known the solution to for many decades. Okay. We just can't figure out a way to get there. I hear two things that Netanyahu has made a point of. One, he said a sticking point was that Abbas refused to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. Now, this is an argument that the prime minister has been making over the last three or four years, but not before that. I think that at one point, I don't remember the exact year, Netanyahu introduced this as another standard. As a negotiating as, it, Well, because issue. it was another obstacle that had to be introduced against progress in, in, in the so-called peace process. Um, what, what does he mean and what's the impact He wants of the Palestinians to declare the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state. I do, too. I have to say that I would not hold the future of the Jewish state or the Palestinian community hostage to such, such a declaration right. because a treaty in which Palestine agreed to live side by side in peace with, it, with Israel would seem to me to a be kind recognition. Of a de facto recognition. I think so. Of Israel as a so. Jewish state. Now, Israel is a Jewish state. But again, you know, every time the argument goes back to the question of rights, the discussion shuts down. The beauty of the partition idea of the territorial compromise idea of the two-state solution idea of the territories for peace idea is that it suspends the argument from rights because both peoples have a right to the same land. There's no such thing as having a right to half of something. So the only way to proceed, and the ancient rabbis in their wisdom knew this when they, when they, when they wrote about torts, the only way to proceed is to divide it. Now we can argue about the, 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 the kind of division and the terms of the division and so on, but the principle of the division as, as the essential condition for an end to the conflict seems to me indisputable, indisputable. Do you believe it's possible for Palestinians and Israelis to live side by side in peace, or do you believe uh, that it is possible for there to be circumstances that can get beyond their inability to live side by side in peace? 
um, there's no question in my mind that if and when a, a deal is made between Israel and Palestine, there will be radical Palestinians, militants who will turn to violence, right? right? When the Good Friday Agreement was made in Ireland, when finally that miracle was wrought, you may recall that when the IRA decided to negotiate, there appeared an organization called the Real IRA, right? Those were the stalwarts. Who, the Real IRA, however, became a security problem, not a political problem and not a strategic problem, because the communities had agreed to reconcile. So yes, there will be a problem of violence. The prestige of religious violence in the Muslim world right now is unfortunately very high. Um, and there, there, there are currents in the Muslim world all around Israel right now that are deeply violent. Uh, and this is something that Israel has to live with now and may have to live with then. But the basic principle that the two communities, f for reasons of self-interest, but also for moral reasons, have to reconcile and finally put an end to this conflict seems, as I say, indisputable to me. Um, I don't think it's going to happen now, and it may not happen in Do my lifetime. Do you think that's the opinion of the majority of Israeli citizens? I don't know. I think it depends how you ask the question. Do they want to be? Do they want to be out of fear that what he was able to do, in a sense, was make the argument that Israel is more secure with me? Look, Israel's security policy right now, as far as I can tell, consists in a wall and a war every two or three years. That's, uh, you know, the wall works, but it's not the best symbol of what we want. Um, and the the wars, we know about the problem with these wars. Um, I think that. Um, Netanyahu won this election ugly. He won it ugly. Yeah. Um, and he debased his country with some of his rhetoric, especially with what he said about the Arab citizens of Israel. So should the Israeli government demand that um, the Palestinian Authority uh, not deal with Hamas and, and not make a, uh, a, a coalition? with Hamas? I think the Israeli government should Or should they say, you know, you've got these terrible elements there and you, it's up to you to control them if you want to present yourself, as they view the Hamas? I think that, um, that the problem of Hamas is something that the PA and now the Egyptians together have got to find a solution to. Um, I don't think Israel should deal with Hamas, even though there are informal contacts and things. You don't? No, I don't. I think that there are limits. No, I don't. I think that an organization that regularly rains rockets upon yeah, a civilian I mean, population... People have dealt with their enemies for a long time. I understand that, but they have now to why, deal with... Why should because this be an there's exception? no indication on the side of Hamas that they're the sort of enemy who's prepared to deal with their enemy. No, if there's some evidence, sure, sure. But I don't see any evidence. I don't see any evidence. Look, the Palestinian community, insofar as I understand it, and I don't speak or read Arabic, so I'm not as inside as I am with the Israeli community, has got, it's a very troubled community politically. It's divided. Um, there is a lot of violence. Um, it's, it, they, they, they have a lot of, of in-house business to take care of, which is one of the reasons I don't expect there to be a deal in the short term. My main concern is that in the absence of a deal, the situation between Israel and the Palestinians not get further poisoned. Not get further poisoned. And the kind of rhetoric that Netanyahu used to clinch this election, um, it's not going to be forgotten. Yeah. He, may, he may take it back, but... I, I had Ari Shavitz and Jeffrey Goldberg and yeah. others here last night to talk about the Israeli election. Yeah. And one of the questions I asked was, did Netanyahu win this or did Herzog lose this? Did Herzog present the kind of arguments and the kind of, of that would have created a resonance with the Israeli people that was different? I mean, I did he make the case for two-state solution? Did he make a case that I have a different answer for Israeli security, as obviously Yitzhak Rabin could have made and would have made? Look, I Am I right? I think so. I think so. I think they did as good as they can. They did better than they have in a long time. Yeah. And they, I think but they the, principally appealed to economic issues. They, print, they did that. That's right. They did that. They did not um, make the case on the security. Well, they talked about it, but it was clear in the election that, in, in the campaign, that more and more Israelis cared about 
domestic issues, right. about issues of, of, of social justice and of economic then inequality. Then why did that prevail? Uh, because Netanyahu, because the base, Netanyahu's base, was not just confined to the Likud. There was also Bennett's party right, and other right. parties. And one of the reasons Bennett didn't do as well as people thought he was is because Netanyahu summoned back some of the zealous Who to the Likud. To go yeah. to and party. when they heard some of the things that he was saying, I'm not surprised that they decided to vote for him. It worked. Well, you know what the Obama administration says about Netanyahu's proposals. They say, you know, that they're going to get nowhere and all he will be left with is a military solution, I a military that, option. I'm not even sure there will be a military option. I don't believe that the Obama deal is going to get us anywhere either. Uh, I think that when Netanyahu said that, that a deal that was conditional upon a recognition of the nature of the Iranian regime's foreign policy upon its support for terrorism and so on um, is, the, is, is the only kind of deal there should be. I'm actually quite sympathetic to that. I think that, that Sympathetic to, to what he said in Congress about yeah. linking the deal to some recognition of what sort of regime there is in Tehran. I mean, the Obama administration frequently seems to forget that this is a despotic, tyrannical, theocratic, criminal regime. There is no reason whatsoever to trust it on this question. There is no evidence whatsoever that the Iranians have made any strategic decision to renounce a nuclear capability. Um, you know, the, 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 the deal that's now being discussed consists in a diminishment of the Iranian capability for a period of 10 years. Um, um, with, and, and the Obama administration sometimes talks about it well, in, the well, tones of, in the tones of a grand bargain so that Iran will then become a flourishing regional power. Who on earth wants this regime to become a flourishing regional power? Anybody who does anything to legitimate or prop up or, or with the, the regime in, in Tehran is an enemy of Iran, is an enemy of Iran. And the only solution there will eventually be to this problem, unfortunately, it's, its clock is ticking more slowly than the nuclear clock, will be the, 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 the arrival one happy day of a democratic, accountable government in Tehran. And when might that come? I don't know. In June 2009, the streets of Iran erupted with democratic protests, with a democratic Protest over rebellion. The of an election, yes. yes. And, and the United States basically turned its back on them. Um, they were shouting Obama's name, and he was thinking of Mossadegh. And... Um, you know, it's, but this is a long time. I understand that the nuclear clock is ticking more quickly than the, than the democracy clock in Iran. But it is a question, I, as some would argue, I mean, everybody that I know believes that a central tenet of any agreement has to be um, inspections. Because the likelihood of a nuclear capacity from Iran is probably going to come not from some count of centrifuges that you can see, but by some covert program. The problem you can't is see. that there were inspections and we were twice surprised. That's the point. Um, they lie. Uh, I think that the they lie, and I think that the the obvious objective of the Iranian regime in these nuclear negotiations is relief from sanctions, and they are prepared. It seems, if they are prepared, but the most they seem prepared to be to do is to restrain their nuclear capabilities for a delimited period of time so as to get relief from the sanctions. That seems to be their strategic objective. And you, the only reason they're there is because of the sanctions, as far as I can tell. The only reason they've come to the table. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. L let me turn to this, just back to Israel. What yeah. is it that you study the most? What is it about Israel and its history that you love the most? What is it that makes the Israel and different groups in Israel honor you so? Israel is a genuinely lovable and admirable place in many ways. One of the reasons I was so disgusted by some of the things that Netanyahu said at the end of the campaign is that they paint a picture of a country that is much nastier and uglier than the country of Israel in fact is. Israel has a somewhat dysfunctional political system. Israel, however, is a Western-style democracy, a genuine democracy. Israel may commit human rights violations, but it has scores of its own human rights groups holding it to account. Mm -hmm. Israel is a, 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 a society that is bursting, bursting with spirit and culture and life. Um, Israel is a genuinely admirable place in many ways, but Israel is being tested because it has this problem 
and that he can't deal with the Palestinians. Yeah, and uh, look, um, you know, a democracy is tested. Democracies are tested by many things. Um, Israel has a free press. Israel has an independent, a wildly independent judiciary. Israel has a wildly free political system. Um, Israel is some, in some ways not doing so well by one of the other tests of a democracy, which is how, national democracy, which is how it t treats its minorities. Mm. Um, my, my question was broader than that, not just this, mm. the contemporary Israel, what you mm. love about it. It is about Israel and its cultural tradition and its religious tradition. I mean, you are, in a sense, received a huge prize. I did, yeah. I was for very your, honored, yeah. For, for your writings and comprehension and eloquent testimony to that part of the heritage of Israel. The, the story of the Jewish people is one of the great human stories. Um, and it, its moral and emotional force is much greater than anything ethnic or religious. And one of the great moments in that human story was that on the, on, on the, in the aftermath, on the day after, the Jewish people suffered the most unimaginably horrific destruction possible. The Jewish people revived itself in a national sovereign state, and even more movingly in a way, and this happened before the destruction of European Jewry, the Jewish people invented an, an, a whole new language for itself. I mean, the, the, the story of modern Hebrew is one of the most stirring cultural stories I have ever heard, mm. ever. And it is um, one of my great complaints against American Jewry, who are virtually unlettered in Hebrew, is that they deny themselves the greatest riches of their own tradition because of this illiteracy. Um, as a Jew, I live mostly in Hebrew because we have a language, and a language is the air that a tradition and a culture breathes. As a Jew, I think in Hebrew, I read in Hebrew, sometimes I even write in Hebrew. Um, you know, the guy in me is happy in English. But, um, but I, so I'm very stirred by this, and the spiritual, literary, cultural resources of this language, and more generally, of the, of the Jewish story, seem immeasurable to me. So actually, I've always regarded it as a great honor to have been born a Jew. I was, I, you know, it was an accident to birth. I'm jealous of converts because they made a decision. I didn't have to make a decision. It was an accident of birth, but I've always regarded it as a very lucky accident of birth. Of course, all accidents of birth then have to, you have to imbue them with a kind of inner necessity. You have to come to possess them. You know, you know things are, not everything that is given is received. Mm -hmm. And it isn't re received until you agree to receive it. But for all these reasons, um, it has been one of the great pleasures of my life, not just one of the great, you know, solemn intellectual obligations, to acquit myself well when it comes to the tradition of my people. This is part one of a two-part conversation with Leon Wieseltier. Uh, when, when we come back uh, later, on another day, we will talk about uh, the New Republic, a place no. that he spent 30 years of his life. Uh, it is now not part of his life, except in his memory. And we'll talk about where he goes from here. That's part two of a conversation with Leon Wieseltier. For more about this program and early episodes, visit us online at pbs.org and charlierose.com.